Welcome, welcome to Schrodinger's Watermelon. Today we are going to see a practical example of dry macros. In the last video, we talked about there are two types of macros in Rust. The last video's topic was about declarative macros, the ones that look like a function and are easiest type of macro to write, comprehend and maintain. Today we are stepping into the procedural territory. Procedural macros look like a header or a marker. They are usually used before a struct, a field or a function. And they are more challenging to write, understand and maintain. The reason why they are tough to work with is because how they work under the hood. Procedural macros first take a piece of code and parses it to tokens. Tokens are any meaningful piece of word in a code. Then creates a token stream. To oversimplify, token stream is similar to a vector of tokens. And then you, the macro developer, manipulate the code, add, remove or change tokens in a token stream. Then the procedural macro generates new code. There are mainly three subtypes of procedural macros dry macros, attribute macros, and function-like macros. Today we are going to focus on dry macros specifically. If you have familiarized yourself with Rust code for a while, you have probably seen many dry macros provided by the standard library that can be defined above a struct. The fact is, these are actually simple traits in the standard library. In fact, you can go ahead and implement debug manually, but debug has its own dry macro, so you don't have to worry about manually implementing it, unless your implementation is oddly specific. This helps you do more with less code. Our dry macro project will be a throwaway reflection library. We will have a trait named reflective and we will write a dry macro for it. Later in the code, the devs who derive reflective trait will be able to print out the name and the field names of a struct. Before we start, however, I need to clarify a few things just like the video before. This is just a practical example video. I will talk about the theory as much as it's required. And also you may have seen some libraries like the popular one Serdy, which heavily utilizes attributes as well. This video will only show you a very simple and primitive trait implementation with dry macros. We'll not dive into the dry macros with attributes, this will be the subject of another video. First we will create a fresh Rust project and launch it in VS Code. In main file we will create a struct named foo with some arbitrary fields. In main function, we will initialize foo with some unimportant values. Then we will try to print the name of the struct. At this point, we don't have a name method on foo. We will create a reflective trait and put the name method in it. And then we will manually implement it first to see why it's absolutely necessary to write a dry macro for a reflective trait. We will create libres file for our root project and add the public reflective trait in it. This reflective trait will only have a name method for now. In main file, we will manually implement this trait. The name method will return the name of the struct. When we execute the program, it will print out the name of the struct. But manually implementing reflective has a fatal problem. We can simply change the return value to anything else, which won't be the same as the name of the struct. The same can be said about the struct's name itself. If I change it to something else, the return value of name method will stay as foo. So we definitely need a dry macro for reflective since it can set the return value of name method to the name of the struct on compile time. The way you add procedural macros to your project is different. While declarative macros can stay in the same code base in your project, procedural macros need another special crate, which I will refer to as subproject during the video. You can actually observe this in the real world by checking the other projects which heavily utilize procedural macros. So the drive, actix macros and Tokyo macros are some of them. That's why we need to create a subproject named Reflective Derive as a type of library. In cargo toml of this subproject, we will define the type of project as proc macro. In terminal, we will change directory to this subproject and add sin and quote as dependencies of this project. While writing a procedure macro, you deal with tokens. Tokens and token stream is cumbersome to deal with, so you usually need a third party help which eases the process of writing procedural macros. Sin and Quote are the most popular crates that help you with procedural macros. Sin is a crate which takes token stream and converts it into an abstract syntax tree with metadata of each token. On the other hand, Quote does the reverse of Sin. It takes the abstract syntax tree and converts it back to token stream. Our next step is to add subproject to the root project so we can access the dry macro in the subproject later on. After we have set up the subproject type as a proc macro, you will probably realize perfect defined code in the subproject will not compile. If you check the error, it will provide a good explanation for you. 
The crates which are marked with PROC macro can only publicize procedural macros. That means no regular functions, no structs or enums. After clearing the subproject, we will define our derived macro function. The characteristics of derived macro functions are that they take a token stream as input and return token stream again. And also they are marked with PROC macro derive. The name of our derived macro will be the same as the name of the trait. There are mainly two things you do in a derived macro function. First, you parse the given token stream and then you return a new token stream including the changes in code on compile time. In order to parse the given token stream, we will use the parse function in sync rate and we will unwrap the result. Parse function will return an abstract syntax tree of type derive input. Drive input is a type providing some metadata about the struct it's used on, such as the visibility, identifier, generic types, and data type of the struct. We will generate the implementation in another regular function called impl reflective trait and return. In implementation function, we will do two things for now. We will get the identifier of the target struct and then we will return the new code. We will get the identifier of the target struct from the ident field of abstract syntax tree. This field's type is ident. You can think of ident as the name of the struct. And then we will get the struct's name as a string. Finally, we will generate the implementation code using the code macro in the code crate and we will convert it to a token stream using into. There are some things you should be aware of about this implementation code. Notice how we used variables outside code macro by prepending them with pound signs. We have used ident variable in the beginning of implementation. And then we have used ident str later on in the name method. The reason why we have separated ident str is because string type will be rendered as string slice in the generated code. Now it's time to use this derived macro. First we need to get to the libRS in root project and export the reflected macro using pub use. And then, in the main file, we can simply clear out the manual implementation and replace it with our dry macro. Now we can fire up a terminal, get to the root project directory and run the project to see it runs as expected. We can test if the behavior is consistent by changing the struct's name. Since the code being generated on compile time depends on the name of the struct, the expected behavior will be consistent no matter how many times we change struct's name. Let's say we also want to get the names of the fields. In order to do that, we will add another method called field names in reflective trait. In the implementation function, we will get each identifier of each field in the struct. First, we will match the type of abstract syntax tree. Data field of drive input is an enum, telling whether the type of deriving Rust code is a struct, enum, or union. As we only deal with structs, we will panic if the data type of abstract syntax tree is enum or union. When you panic in a procedural macro, the whole compilation process fails, so this is not a runtime panic. If the data type of tree is struck, however, we will iterate over each field. We will get the identifier of each field and finally collect it into a vector of identifiers. Just like the name of the struct, we also need to convert the name of each field to a string as well. In the implementation, we will add field names method. Field names method will return a vector of string slices. So in the quote macro, we need to unpack each field one by one. In order to do that, we start with a pound sign, parenthesis, a separator, and a repetition operator, similar to what we have done in the previous declarative macros video. Inside parenthesis, we will put field idents strs variable. This will unpack each item in field idents strs one by one into the generated code. In the main file, we will print out the field names method generated by reflective macro. When we run the program, we can see the name of each field. You can also try to remove, change or add another field in the struct. Since the code is generated in compile time, the output of program will behave consistently. Thanks for making it up to this point. Hopefully this video has been a helpful guide for you. If you want to go beyond practical, check the links to the documentation in the description. If you want more of these videos, remember to like, share and subscribe. Catch you in the next video.